All right, friends, well, we are going to be jumping into John chapter 11 today. We are continuing our sermon series through the book of John uh, called Life with Jesus. And our hope for today is that you would experience life with Jesus even now as we spend time in his word, even now as we interact with him uh, through his story and by the power of his spirit. Uh, Before we jump in, I do just want to ask you, please keep praying for the Holmes family. Caleb uh, leaves tomorrow, drives out, and uh, Lauren and the kids will follow in a few days. And if you don't know Lauren, she's a Canadian who hates the cold and they're going to Kansas. So just pray for him, okay? Uh, If you've got to John chapter 11 in your copy of the scriptures, say, I got it. Okay, a few of us. You, yeah, the rest, we've got some time to catch up. We'll have it up on the screen as well. Uh, would you join me just in a word of prayer before we jump in? Lord Jesus, we do thank you for another opportunity to gather together as your people, your family, your community. We pray now that you would meet us as we open up your word, that your story would be our story. Lord, we pray that you would open up our eyes to see you for who you truly are open up our ears to hear those words that you are speaking to us. Lord, I I pray for myself as I bring your word to your people. Would you have me say the words that you want me to and not say the words you don't want me to? Lord, speak through me today. We say, speak now for your servants are listening. Amen. I'd like to start with a question that maybe for some of us it hasn't been asked in a little while. What is your favorite fairy tale? Well, let's do this. Turn to somebody sitting around you and tell them what's your favorite fairy tale. You don't got to be shy. You can have a favorite fairy tale. It's okay. You can say it out loud. Whatever your favorite is probably depends in some part on what age you are. I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, Maybe you remember when parents and grandparents opened up these things called books and read to their children. Like at bedtime, this this is a thing that used to happen. I know about it because I watched The Princess Bride. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. There's a grandpa reading a fairy tale to his grandson. And I'm like, okay, that's, I'm grateful for that cultural relic because now I know that that used to happen and not just like cartoons all the time. Maybe, maybe your favorite fairy tale is the princess bride. And if that is true, good for you. Never change. That, that is a good choice. I, I appreciate that. If you're like me, a child of the nineties, I just gave myself away. Uh, probably most of your fairy tales came off the production line of the Walt Disney studio at some point or another, which is not a bad thing. I mean, the, the late 80s into the 90s, 89 to 99, golden age of Disney movies. Like, like think, here's the list. Uh, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Lion King, Aladdin, Pocahontas, Hercules, Mulan, Tarzan. That's hit after hit after. There's not a bad movie or a bad song in there. Like it's all, those are some strong fairy tales. And you're like, Tarzan's not a fairy tale. Well, sure it is. If you know what the components of a fairy tale are. One of uh, the the most famous definitions of a fairy tale actually came from that British author J.R.R. Tolkien. You know him as the author of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and everything else around the Lord of the Rings. He said that a fairy tale needs basically four things. It needs a, a supernatural world or at least a world that has different laws of nature like gorillas can talk to a human and raise him. That, so that, we check that box. It's a world where love is eternal where good triumphs over evil, and where the hero escapes from death. These are the essential parts of a fairy tale, according to Tolkien. He saw his own work with Lord of the Rings as a fairy tale. Other famous authors thought that fairy tales were so important, they strove to write new ones for adults. This is actually why C.S. Lewis wrote books like the Narnia series and the Space Trilogy. That hideous strength is a book with a subtitle, A Modern Fairy Tale for Grown-Ups. Authors know that fairy tales are important to us. And this is why we, we are so drawn to them, continually even reproducing them in our media. They have these four interesting elements. A supernatural world love that is eternal, good triumphing over evil, and the hero escaping death. 
As I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but wonder if that last one, hero escaping death, is the thing that keeps us in our culture clinging on to fairy tales. Most of the other stuff we, we've recognized by now in our sophisticated postmodern society is just foolishness. You know, a supernatural world? No, 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 no. We can explain all that away through science. Love that is eternal? Oh, that sounds really nice, but that's just not the way the world works. You only have to love once in order to be burned to know that's not true. Good triumphing over evil? If only that were the case. But escaping death? Well, we like those stories. We tell those stories. Those are the stories that make the news. When someone narrowly escapes the jaws of death, there are books that have sold millions and millions of copies of people chronicling their own near-death experiences. Why? For one, I think it's because we know, all of us, some, somewhere deep down, that death is not the way it was meant to be. Even the, the pure materialist says there is nothing to life except what we can see and touch is uncomfortable with death. Why? Because I think at some level they know death is not what we were made for. And because of that, we surround ourselves with stories of heroes who escape death because we, we think that if we can just avoid death long enough, we can escape it ultimately someday. I think this is why we like fairy tales so much. The only problem is reality. (laughs) The only problem is that as we go through life, we recognize that we're surrounded by death every day. And I'm not just talking about that thing that no one can explain that is waiting for you at the end of life. No, no, no. If we open up the pages of scripture, we see that when our first parents, the first humans, sinned and rebelled against God, death entered the world, and death is an impatient beast. It's not waiting for us to come to it. Rather, death is invading and infiltrating life, seeking to take whatever territory it can for itself. Genesis 4 says that that sin and the death that accompanies it is like a beast crouching in wait, waiting to get us. We experience this in in little and big ways all the time. We see the death of a friendship, the death of a a season of life, the, the death maybe of a loved one, or the death of a dream that you've been clinging to. And it can sometimes feel so overwhelming that we want nothing more to escape it. Enter Frozen, right? Like this is where the fairy tales come in. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis both made the case that fairy tales are, are so attractive to us precisely not because they are a form of escapism, but because they reflect something deeply embedded in us about what it means to be human. That they reflect actually in some way the story of the gospel. That in the gospel of Jesus we see that indeed we do live in a supernatural world where God is at work. We see that love truly is eternal. That good ultimately will triumph over evil. And we see that death is not the true end. But what I love about the story of Jesus is that it is no fairy tale. See, Jesus doesn't seek to escape death by avoiding it. Rather, Jesus confronts death to its face. We see this in John chapter 11. Uh, Join back in the story with me in verse 38. It says, then Jesus deeply moved again. Say deeply moved. Deeply moved again came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Now, uh, Pete did a great job pointing this out at the park party last week, if you were there, but I think it's a point that bears repeating. That word that gets translated here, deeply moved, is a Greek word that carries with it the, the sense of angry indignation. 
That yes, Jesus did weep over the death of his friend. Jesus did sit in mourning with Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters. But when Jesus begins moving to the grave, it is not in sorrow, but in indignation. Jesus is not angry at Lazarus for dying. Rather, he's angry at the death and sin which took him. And when we see Jesus confront death, he doesn't simply confront a a fact, a, a philosophical idea. No, Jesus enters in in order to deal with the pain of death, destroy the power of death, and dismantle the presence of death in the world. Look at verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Do do you see what's happening here? Picture Jesus, if you will. He's just been comforting Mary and Martha, and now he moves toward the grave of his friend Lazarus and tells the people around him to roll away the stone. Jesus is about to do something remarkable, and yet Martha protests. Do you see it? Here's Jesus. He's about to do something miraculous. He's about to prove that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and yet Martha wants him to stop because she doesn't understand. Can you imagine This this Martha, the same Martha who just a few verses before said, Jesus, I know you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. I, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you can do what you say you're gonna do. That Martha now confronts Jesus at the edge of her brother's tomb because faith does not erase the pain of death. Can I just tell somebody real fast that that maybe at some point you picked up the idea that because death still stings, that because you've experienced hurt and, and brokenness in your life, that your faith must not be good enough. That is a lie. That is not from Jesus. Here is Martha who has just made the most profound profession of faith yet in the gospel of John proclaiming Jesus not only to be the Christ, but also the Son of God. And this same Martha, with all of her faith, is still experiencing the pain that death brings with it. That the fact that you're hurting is not evidence that you do not know Jesus or that Jesus does not know you. The fact that you are hurting is an occasion, an opportunity for Jesus to meet you in your pain and to do something miraculous. Martha says, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. That that four days there is significant. I want us to see this. You see, at this time, Jews believed that when a person died, their soul kind of hovered above the body for about three days. And after those three days, decay started to set in. And at some point on the third or maybe the fourth day, the soul would look at its former body, not recognize it because it had decayed and said, I don't know you, I'm out of here. So the soul would depart on the fourth day. That's what they believed. And so the fact that Martha is telling Jesus, look, it's the fourth day. This is her saying, if you would have got here yesterday, maybe you could have done something, but now he's beyond hope. If you would have got here when we called you, you could have saved him, but now there's nothing you can do. Martha is telling Jesus that he is dead, dead. He is beyond saving. It seems to me that that sometimes the pain that we have experienced can lead us to resist allowing Jesus to come into the dead parts of our lives. We think that the magnitude of pain can somehow overwhelm Jesus' ability to do anything for us or in us. And so Jesus comes and stands at the edge of our deadness and says, roll away the stone. And we say, no, no, Jesus, you don't understand. 
I'm beyond hope. You, you can't do anything for me. Maybe if you had gotten here earlier, but not anymore. Jesus stands outside the tomb of our dead relationships and we say, no, 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 Jesus, this marriage died a long time ago. He stopped listening a long time ago. She stopped talking shortly after that. Your power is no good here. Jesus stands on, on the edge of our dead and broken behaviors. And we say, Jesus, you don't, you don't get it. I've tried to fix this myself. I've tried to bring this back to life. I've set the bottle down I don't know how many times. I've gone to meetings I don't know how many times. I've put every filter on my computer that I can find, but I'm beyond hope. I just keep falling back in. Use your power somewhere else, Jesus. We put limits on what Jesus can do with our deadness. They're not his limits. They're, they're our limits that we force upon him. We stand at the edge of a tomb in mourning and grief, unable to change a thing. Meanwhile, Jesus stands beside us, indignant at the pain and death we've experienced and tells us to move the stone. Oh, but that's not the only reason why Martha protests. Look at it again. She doesn't just say that Lazarus is beyond hope. She says, Lord, by this time, there will be an odor. I like the way the old King James says it. It says, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. Let's just use that however you like. I've got a 12-week-old baby at home. I know I'm going to be able to put that one to good use. He stinks. There, there is a stench coming up from the, the deadness within the tomb. You know that's what happens to dead things, right? No matter what it is, an animal on the side of the road, a vegetable that's, that's been left too long on the vine, a flower that's been cut and put in a vase, if you leave it long enough, dead things begin to have an odor. But it's not just true with organic material. No, did you know that when you bury an emotion, it begins to ferment and it gains an odor. Did you know that when you bury bitterness and unforgiveness, a, a stench begins to rise from it? Did, did you know that when you bury the memory of pain or hurt or death, it carries with it an aroma? See, if we let the dead things in our lives fester long enough, the, the thought of even remembering that pain becomes unbearable to the point that we stand between Jesus and the tomb and say, go no further. I wonder if we do this because we fear what will happen if that odor is allowed to hit the open air. I wonder if we fear... The, the memories that will be triggered if we roll away the stone to let Jesus do something with it. I wonder if we're afraid of what other people will think around us when they catch a whiff of our past. We so fear this risk of exposure that we seek to bury things however we can. After all, if it doesn't hit oxygen, it won't stink, right? Right? So we build tombs and we roll stones. I don't know how you do it. I know some people do it by, by withdrawing into themselves, putting on a, a, a relational facade to appear whole, but just cover up the brokenness within. Some people do it by buying a facade for themselves purchasing all the things that the world tells us should make your life good in order to cover up all the things in your life that are not so good. Those are nothing more than tombs and stones covering up deadness. And Jesus is asking to be let in. Look how Jesus responds to Martha in verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, 
you would see the glory of God. Look at this gentle reminder from Jesus. He understands the the fear in, in Martha's voice. He knows the pain that she might be risking if she allows the tomb, the the stone to be rolled away. And he says, hold on, haven't I promised you? Didn't, Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? This is a reference back just a few verses to verses 25 and 26 of this chapter when Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. The the glory that Jesus is pointing to here in verse 40 is the resurrection. It is experiencing resurrection life, life beyond death. Jesus is saying, Martha, Martha, don't you see that only dead things can be resurrected? Roll away the stone. If you believe, you will see the glory of God, his resurrection life. And isn't it interesting here that Jesus does not simply snap his fingers, make the stone disappear into thin air, and have Lazarus come skipping out of the tomb. Certainly he had the, the power to do that, and yet as Jesus confronts death, he first pauses to address the pain that death brings and then he invites us to roll away the stone. Jesus could have taken the stone away all on his own, but he invites us to express our trust in him through action. That's that's what's happening here in verses 40 and 41. He's inviting the Martha and Mary and their community to trust him with the most painful and vulnerable part of their life so that he can get to his work of bringing about something new. What does Jesus do when they take away the stone? We keep reading. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, what is Jesus doing here? He's praying. Put yourself back in the, in the scene one more moment. You're, you're standing next to Martha, feeling her still heaving with sobs. As you look expectantly at Jesus, the stone is rolled away. And instead of walking another step toward the tomb, he stops and he looks up and he says, Father. Maybe that sounds comforting. And I think it, it should. But as I was putting myself in this place and imagining this, I felt annoyed. Like, Jesus, don't you know we've been doing that for a week now? Jesus, don't you know that we've been praying for the last three days for God to raise him back up? Don't you know that we were praying before he died for him to not die, for him to be saved and continue to live? What are you doing praying? Every breath out of of my mouth for the last week has started, Father, please give us back Lazarus. I can't help but wonder if somebody was annoyed. But look, Jesus doesn't start his prayer with, Father, please. No, no, no. He says, Father, thank you. How could Jesus do that? Father, thank you that you have heard me. How could Jesus thank God when his friend is still dead in the grave? Verse 42. I knew that you always hear me. Jesus can thank God before he even makes his request because God the Father already knows what Jesus is going to ask and has already granted it to him. It's almost as if Jesus and the Father are one. It's, it's incredible. Of course, that's what Jesus has just said. Jesus doesn't even have to ask and he already knows that the Father will grant him whatever he asks. Jesus didn't even have to pray. He said, God, I already knew that you would hear me. I'm not praying for myself, but I said this on account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus 
stands in front of an open tomb and he doesn't pray for Lazarus. That's something scandalous, isn't it? He doesn't pray for Lazarus. Why? Because he already knows he's got Lazarus. He already knows the father has heard him about Lazarus. He already knows that Lazarus is secure in his hands. He prays for the people around watching. He says, Father, I know that you're going to give me Lazarus, but would you give me these people too? Would they come to believe that you sent me through what I'm about to do? Friend, he wasn't just praying for people 2,000 years ago. If it's really true that scripture is God's story, which is our story, then we can pretty easily see ourselves standing around the tomb watching Jesus. Jesus is praying for us in this moment. And this wasn't a one-time thing. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 tells us that Jesus is still alive. It says he li- he's able to completely save those who come to God through him because, catch this, he always lives to intercede for them. That Jesus after his crucifixion, went through death and was raised to glorious resurrection life. He ascended into heaven and even now as he sits at the right hand of the Father, he is praying for you and me, asking God to work his will in our lives. And God has already heard him before he even prays it and granted it to him. This ought to be comforting. This means that if you are a Christian, if you follow Jesus, that Jesus is praying to the Father for you daily. He always lives to intercede for you. It also means that if you've been investigating Christianity, asking questions of Jesus, seeking to find out if Jesus is who he says he is, and you've been feeling a pull on your life to follow him, that Jesus is praying for you too. That he is in this moment asking God to give you faith as you see what he's about to do. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus goes a step further as he gives us a sign to reassure you that you can trust him. Verse 43 and 44. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I read a couple commentators who said that the loud voice wasn't for Lazarus' benefit. After all, he was dead. The loud voice was to make sure that everybody around could hear what he was doing. He says, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out. No, that didn't move anybody? Okay, let's try it again. The man who had died, that, that is a perfect past tense. This has happened. It is done. It is a sure thing. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his faith faith still wrapped in a cloth. This is the seventh sign that we've seen Jesus perform in John. This is the culmination of everything that Jesus has said and done to prove that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, that he is the Son of God. And in this sign, we see that Jesus is able not only to deal with the pain of death, the, the, the symptoms of death, he is able to confront and destroy the very power of death. Here's Lazarus. Do you see the, the great lengths that John has gone to to remind us of his deadness? He told us earlier that Martha was the dead man's sister. We already knew that. He told us earlier that he had been dead four days. We already knew that. He tells us here that the man who had died walked out because John wants us to catch the full gravity of the situation that's playing out in front of our eyes. Lazarus was so fresh from death that he walked out still bound in his grave clothes. That cloth that's mentioned would have probably been a long cloth wrapped from toe and around his head and back down. And the linens were then tied around the outside to bind his arms and his feet together. Can you see Lazarus shuffling out as quickly as he can at the call of his Savior? 
I read some other commentators who said that it's a good thing Jesus said Lazarus come out because if he hadn't specified who he was talking to, every grave would have opened and everybody would have come on out. That's the kind of power that Jesus has over death. But, but it's not just the fact that Jesus raises Lazarus, even though that, that would have been enough. Look at the way Jesus raises Lazarus. You would expect him to stand at the tomb and to say, Lazarus, get up. But he doesn't do that. Jesus speaks to the dead man as if he is already alive and no sooner do the words fall out of his mouth than it becomes true. Jesus literally speaks new life where there had only been death. And he does it in such a way that no one can question. Even the most skeptical critic can't escape the veracity of this miracle because of how Jesus performed it. Sure, they could try. You know, someone might say, well, maybe Lazarus wasn't really dead. That could be an option. Tell that to the friends and family who watched him breathe his last, wrapped him in linens and cloth, and rolled a stone to cut off his oxygen for four days doesn't hold up. Well, maybe, maybe it wasn't really a miracle. Maybe Jesus just performed a little sleight of hand. Maybe it was like a, a magic trick, right? Maybe he was not all dead, but just like mostly dead. But Jesus is no miracle max. Jesus stands in plain view of everyone and calls out. There was no funny business going on, no, no gimmicks. Maybe someone says, oh, okay, well, well, how do we even know it was Lazarus? After all, his face is covered up. Maybe Jesus pulled the old switcheroo. You tell that to the community that goes to their friend, unwraps his face and sees the man that they had buried days before. The only possible explanation for this miracle is that it happened. The only possible explanation is that Jesus truly does destroy the power of death. That's good news, friends, because it means that when you are in the grip of death's power, that death is not the most powerful thing in your life. That even when you are surrounded by the deafening silence of the grave, the grave never gets the last word because all Jesus has to do is speak. Come out and give you new life. The power of Jesus for resurrection life is greater than any power death has ever had. This is why he said back in John chapter 5, I tell you the solemn truth. A time is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will, do you remember it? They'll live. Those who hear will live. You see, when the good shepherd calls his sheep, not even the silence of the grave can keep them from hearing and responding in obedience and faith. But John doesn't just tell us this story because he wants us to know what happened back then. This is a real historical account, but that's not the primary reason John is sharing it with us. John wants us to know that Lazarus' story is our story. And that it points us to the even greater story of the gospel. You see, this is not the last time that Jesus will charge at a tomb to destroy death. Is it? This, we will see him do it again. Just in about a week and a half's time. But, but this time, Jesus will not charge through the home of a friend, but rather through the cross of Rome. This time, as Jesus approaches the grave, it will not be with anger in his nostrils, but with nails in his hands. This time, as Jesus enters into the tomb, he does it not in moving indignation, but in the stillness of death. This time, Instead of asking, well, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind, couldn't he have saved his friend? The people will jeer at him and ask, if you're the son of God, can't you save yourself? Come on down off that cross. Of course he could have saved himself, but he chose to remain where he was so that he could save us. That is the good news of the gospel. Jesus died and was buried in a tomb, just like Lazarus. A stone was rolled in front of it, just like Lazarus. But that, my friends, is where the similarities end. 
See, Lazarus was dead and unable to do anything for himself. He needed Jesus to come calling in order to walk out. Jesus didn't wait for anybody else to come calling. It says he got up on the third day with all power in his hands by his Holy Spirit. Lazarus, Lazarus wasn't ever going to get up on his own. Lazarus came out still wrapped up in his grave clothes because he's going to need those later. Lazarus was raised to a natural life, but he was going to die again. So he brings his grave clothes out with him, knowing that he'll need them again. Jesus gets up out of the grave dressed in white and radiant, and he leaves his grave clothes neatly folded on the bench he was laying on. He turns to the tomb and says, thank you, you can keep those. I won't need them anymore. I'm not coming back. Jesus, even today, sits enthroned at the right hand of the Father, continually praying for us, interceding for us, that you and I might be brought from death to life, both in in a macro sense, in the the biggest times when you've experienced death, and in those micro-deaths that we die every day. He sends his Holy Spirit to help us so that we can be empowered to experience resurrection life, experience the the supernatural resurrection life of Jesus right now. See, just like death doesn't wait around for life to run out, Jesus' resurrection life doesn't wait around for death to run out. No, Jesus' resurrection life is coming after death. It's pursuing and tracking it down until death itself is destroyed, taking back all the territory that death has taken for itself in our lives because resurrection life starts now. This is what the story of Lazarus tells us. But even as I say that, I understand that that can be a hard truth to accept. After all, if the power of death is really destroyed, if that is true, why do we still see the presence of death in our world? If Jesus is supposed to have destroyed death 2,000 years ago, then how do we explain the world that we live in? If Jesus destroyed death, why does cancer exist? If Jesus destroyed death, why do we struggle with mental health? If Jesus destroyed death, why do relationships die and a little part of us feels like it dies with them? If Jesus destroyed death, why does my career keep coming up to dead end after dead end? I had someone paint the picture for me once this way. The death is like a dragon, a great beast which Jesus slayed on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus pierced the beast in its heart, and it is slowly dying from the inside out. The the power of death has been vanquished, but as it falls, it whips its tail in fury, trying to take anything it can with it. Lazarus walks out of the tomb. The, The power of death has been overcome but he still has on his grave clothes. The presence of death hasn't quite left him yet. But as we look at the last few verses, we see that Jesus doesn't leave unfinished what he has started. Yes, Jesus destroyed the power of death. Yes, we still experience the presence of death day in and day out, but that does not mean that Jesus has left his work undone. Look at Jesus. He said to them, the people standing around, unbind him and let him go. It says many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Do you see what's happening? Jesus turns to the people who are standing around Lazarus and says, unbind him and let him go. This is fascinating to me. The only thing that Jesus does for Lazarus in this story is the thing that only Jesus can do. He speaks new life. He gives life where there had been death. Everything else, he invites the community to be his hands and feet to the one to whom he has given life. 
Jesus could have snapped his fingers and made the stone disappear, but he said to the people standing around, roll away the stone. No one else could give new life, so Jesus speaks, Lazarus, come out. And Jesus does what only he can do. But as Lazarus comes out and he's still bound in his death clothes, Jesus turns to the community and says, go get him. Unbind him and let him go. Help him to walk freely in the newness of life. Friends, as I read this story, I can't help but ponder what it would look like for Resurrection Church to be a community of people who come around those that Jesus is bringing from death to life and to unbind them, to let them go. This is what Jesus is inviting us to here. It seems to me that so often Christians are eager to come around a new believer, not not to unbind the death clothes, but rather to to just start putting on a new outfit, right? Here's here's some books to read. You got to listen to this sermon. Here's some rules to follow. Here's here's a a podcast to listen to. We're going to pile everything on you to cover up all your deadness. But Jesus tells us to take off the death clothes first. What would it be like for us to be that kind of community? It's often done with all the best of intentions, but it's not what Jesus asks for us. This is what, when this happens, like we get surprised months or years later when we've seen someone walking with Jesus and then all of a sudden a little piece of their linen is sticking out. And they're like, we're like, why you still got your death clothes on? What are you doing? Why, Why is that coming out now? That's not your life in Christ. And they say, no one ever helped me take them off. I don't know this for a fact, and I can't speak to everybody's story because everybody's story is different, but I can't help but wonder whether many people's recent efforts in the last couple of years to deconstruct their faith is actually an effort to take off all the new clothes that were put on prematurely in order to deal with the death clothes that were never removed to begin with. As the church we are to come around other believers that Jesus has called to himself to lovingly and graciously unbind them from the things that keep them trapped, the things that are vestiges of the death that is no longer theirs in Christ. To walk with them in newness of life. I think sometimes we get it wrong the other way by the way. I think sometimes in our eagerness to see people be free from their death clothes, we charge into the tomb before Jesus has done the work he needs to do. We try to take the death clothes off a person who is still laying lifeless. We, we, we can't overstep Jesus' work in somebody's life. There's no work that you and I can possibly do to make someone live again. We can't dress someone up the right way to make them have new life in Christ. That life has to come from Jesus. But we do have to be close enough to them so that when Jesus calls them out, they have someone there to help them be set free. We, we can't live our lives in such uh, separation or, or defensiveness that we never allow other people to see what it looks like to take off death clothes. Nor can we be afraid to, to live in the presence of death in the world and miss an opportunity of Jesus calling us to be his hands and feet to somebody after he brings them into new life. Jesus must first give the life. And we've got to be ready to unbind and let go. Look what happens when this is what plays out. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. All along, Lazarus has not been the only dead one in the story. The same miracle that Jesus has performed physically for Lazarus, he has performed spiritually for all these onlookers. 
As, as they witness what it is like for the community of God to come around one person and to help them live in freedom, other people begin to believe. And I got to say, I wonder if God might want to use somebody's sanctification to bring about somebody else's salvation. God might just want to use that dead thing in your life that you're still working in the context of community to unwrap in order to help somebody else look down and say, oh wait, I'm wearing the same outfit. I want some of what you got. Friend, if if you are here and you are not yet a Christian, if, if you are here and you've been considering Jesus and asking good questions, I want you to see your story is Lazarus' story. I want you to see that Jesus is inviting you to roll away the stone. Not just to simply air out all of your mess to the world, not simply to, to, to revisit all of the painful things in your past, but rather so that Jesus can visit you in the midst of them and minister to you in them. I want you to see that Jesus is standing outside of the grave that you've called life for so long, calling you out into new life. And when you get out, I want you to see that you are not alone because he has placed you in a community that he has commanded to come alongside you, to be vulnerable alongside you, and to help you in unbinding you and walking together with you. Friends, what would it be? What would it take for that to be our DNA, our our culture as a church family? What would that be like if that's what played out in our homes over meals and in our small groups and discussions? What would it be like if every time we partied in the park, somebody caught a glimpse of somebody getting their death clothes removed and thinking, I want freedom like that. We're invited to participate in the work that Jesus has started because resurrection life starts now. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this truth. You could have worked in another way. You could have made known to us perfect principles to live by. You could have given us uh, neatly crafted doctrine statements in order to guide our lives, but instead you give us yourself. You give us your, your very own story. You give us your person. Lord, we, we recognize that all of us are Lazarus, that, that in our own strength there is nothing that we could do to make ourselves live again. But we trust that when you ask us to roll the stone that you have something more glorious than we could ever think, ask, or imagine in mind. Lord, we pray that you would, you would make us more acquainted with your resurrection life than we have been with death for so long? Would you make us aware of the wrappings which still need to come off so that we can walk in true freedom? And would you bring people around us who can help us do just that? Would you bring us around people who you have called out of death and give us your ability, your power to help unbind them? Lord, we pray for the people in all the places where we live, work, learn, and play, all, all, all the people of our neighborhoods, our families, our friend groups, our whole region, Lord, would you use our stories, our Lazarus story, to bring some other onlookers into the fold. Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work of salvation, even now, as we trust you with all things. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.